So with Arena kind of feeling a little bit stale currently in Standard, I figured I'd dip my toes into Historic, and I figured I'd give you guys ways if this is something you're also interested in to dive into, maybe starting off on a budget, uh, making a few budget decks for you all to try out. So in today's video, we'll be diving into a few budget decks that I have made for you guys to play, maybe to get yourself started if you're looking to play some Historic Magic. With that being said, hey everyone, I'm Scar TV coming at you with another Magic the Gathering video. If you like the video, hit that like button. It definitely lets me know that you guys like the style of videos. If you're new here, why don't I post videos on the channel hit that subscribe button it's plus one plus one counter on the channel and with that being said let's just dive into the video so with you know standard kind of getting to that stale spot i was kind of thinking to myself let's try to figure out some decks that may be interesting for you guys if this is something you're looking into getting into as some of the cards that you currently are playing standard will be moving over into this format i figure i'd make a few decks maybe to get you inspired if you want to start a little bit early into playing the historic format maybe you're sick of playing the same decks you want to try out a little bit other style of magic so historic is like the other option here currently in arena with that being said the first deck that i kind of came up with that i kind of got a little inspiration from um you know just kind of like seeing some cards and kind of seeing what is available in uh you know stand uh standard historic i figured i'd dive a little bit into the cycling um it is a deck that is still pretty decent it can catch your opponent off guard there is a little bit of great variety just because of the, the arc like phoenix style decks and whatnot but i will be kind of going over more on those decks more in a meta deck if that's something you guys are interested in uh, but this one is Historic Cycling. It actually, I believe, this version is completely uh, rare free. There's not a single rare in it. Uh, everything at most is, if you've already kind of played this deck at some point, maybe you already have the cards. Most of the cards are from Ikoria, with a couple of them kind of from some of, I believe, the anthologies is where you get the Cycling lands, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but you can always craft them as well for common uncommon cards or common uh, wild cards as well as the fire flame blade adept the rest of it is actually oh and the cast out sorry and the cast out which is also from um which we call it almond cat um these are cards that you know you can go ahead and craft yourself they're not expensive to craft so if you have some uncommon wild cards to craft you can definitely make this deck and like i said the deck is very budget friendly without you know costing a single rare so if you're not sure exactly what cycling is essentially cycling is this ability that cards have uh we may play the cycling cost to discard this card and draw a new card the reason why we're trying to do this is trying to do multiple things here. We either are trying to ping our opponent down with a creature that may, say, have whenever we cycle another card, it deals one damage to each opponent. We may try to make some tokens that whenever we cycle another card for the first time each turn, we get a 1-1 one, one white soldier token. Or we're just trying to make some creatures bigger, either this one or this one. Whenever we cycle another card, we get a plus one, plus one counter on Flourish and Fox. Or we get a plus one, plus zero until end of turn uh, whenever we cycle a card. And really the big thing here is in the early game, we're just kind of getting for that extra points of damage or make some big threats that your opponent has to either deal with or we're just trying to hit them as hard as possible, as quick as possible, to then eventually hopefully get in at least, you know, a decent amount of cycling cards in our graveyard to drop a big Xenoflare. Flare. Essentially, Xenoflare Flare is the spell that kind of, you know, makes cycling as good as it is. Um, essentially, it deals X damage to any target where X is the amount of, uh, where we gain X life and X is the amount of cards with cycling abil abilities in our graveyard. So essentially, deal damage to opponent's face or creature that may be in your way, gain X life equal to the amount of cards that are that have the ability cycling in your graveyard. And essentially most of the deck that we are playing outside of a couple cards, I think Xena Flare itself and also Flame Braid Adept, I think all the rest of the cards and maybe our basic lands all have cycling. So that is kind of like one of the key things there. I'll go over the deck list real quick to kind of give you an idea of what cards to play. And there's no rare lands, which is one of the things that you may notice with Historic, that having the rare lands that kind of help you, you know, play things uh, without having to tap your mana is also another key thing that makes a lot of decks in Historic play a lot quicker. But we start off with the Flourish and Fox, uh, four copies, Flame Braid Adept, uh, four copies. It has Menace, which is pretty good. So if your opponent doesn't play a lot of creatures, it makes it definitely hard to chump block, especially if you cycle a lot. Uh, Flip Fall Crater, it for the most part we use it for the cycling but if we need to we can give target creature uh trample and then turn by enchanting one of our lands and tapping it to do this ability uh drain a healer um you know whenever we cycle another card we gain a life valiant rescuer makes tokens and whenever we cycle a card for the first time on a turn drain and stinger pings our opponent every time we cycle uh for one point of damage uh go for blood is kind of like a fight spell in case we need to fight something at sorcery speed but we can also cycle it for one cast out is a interesting card here it's a four mana spell with flash or enchantment with flash we exile target non-land permanent opponent controls until it leaves the battlefield, or we can cycle it for one white mana. Xena Flare as our big finisher to do big damage. And then, you know, the mana base is pretty straightforward. We do play 10 planes, 6 mountains, and then we play these uh, these cycling lands, so we can cycle it for white mana uh, and draw a card, discard a card, or we can cycle this for red mana and 
uh, uh, discard a card and draw a card. So essentially, it's a overall the deck is a cycle of cards into your graveyard. You know, hopefully hit your opponent for some damage early on, and then drop a big Zenith Flare overall to finish off your opponent. With that being said, I mean, this deck is pretty straightforward. Nothing too crazy going on here. It's just a matter of hopefully you get some decent matchups and don't get too much in the way of Graveyard Hate because, unfortunately, if your opponent has some ways to disrupt, you know, your Zenith Flare with Graveyard Hate, uh, if you don't have a consistent enough cycling, you may not be able to keep up with them. With that being said, I mean, this is definitely a good starting point, especially if this is a deck you may have played prior in uh, Standard. Now, this next deck up is a very interesting one. It is a little bit more on the expensive side. Uh, it does have a few more rares. It's one of those things that kind of comes with Historic that a lot of the decks, even for budget style, uh, are a little bit on the expensive side to kind of craft. This one, I believe, comes in at having a total of uh, eight rares in total, um, you know, with them being, you know, the Priest of the Forgotten Gods, God Pharaoh's Gift, and also the Phyrexian Tower. But essentially, this deck is a sacrifice deck in a way. Uh, we're also a self-mill deck in a uh, another way too uh with that being said we have you know overall the strategy here is to you know mill things into our graveyard sacrifice our things into our graveyard you know gain some mana and then we're, we're the big card here the big payoff is getting god pharaoh's gift out onto the battlefield uh the reason why is that's being of our combat turn we may exile target creature card from our graveyard if we do create a token that's a copy of that card except it's a 4-4 black zombie it gains haste until end of turn so essentially, if you look at a lot of our cards, we'll, we can gain copies of, um, you know, they come onto the battlefield. Uh, we definitely, you know, can utilize their effects. We can always even sacrifice them if we really, really need to. Other cards in the deck that take advantage of us having things in our graveyard or creatures in our graveyard are, you know, Lolith Giant. Uh, whenever it enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to each target opponent for each creature card in our graveyard. Our deck is mostly creatures without really any interaction other than the couple artifacts. So there's a lot of things that can definitely hit. Uh, you get this in the later game by getting into your graveyard or in the early game by getting into your graveyard. You can then eventually maybe hit them for a lot more damage. Um, you know, other than that, we have things like uh, the Crow Titan. Uh, Crow of Dark Titans, it's a bird that enters battlefield uh, or dies, we mill two cards, we have Blackborn Rogue, it has plus three plus zero, um, as long as your opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard, also can become a land if we need to. Uh, I feel like I'm going completely out of order, but we'll start off with the Cauldron Familiar. If you haven't, you've been playing Magic Arena maybe for the past like year or so, you may have seen this card at some point, it was a very annoying card, this plus uh, Witch's Oven, essentially when it enters the battlefield, uh, each opponent loses one life we gain a life we sacrifice the food bring it back from the graveyard to the battlefield it was just a very tedious little um tedious little combo kind of thing as you can kind of see it says not legal and tells you what sets um it's just a very tedious card but it's definitely very good because it can chump block and you can sacrifice it you know throw in the graveyard then be summon it back out ping your opponent again for a life and you uh for a life and you gain a life in the process then we have Stitcher Supplier. It's a one mana, one one. When it enters the battlefield, we mill our dies. We mill three cards, so it's just a good way to kind of fill up our graveyard to kind of get it ready for hopefully a God Pharaoh's gift. Which is oven is a way, great way to sacrifice a creature. Um, you know, and sacrifice again a food token in case we either need to eat the food token or just get it for a cauldron familiar that we want to get back onto the battlefield. Uh, Dusk Legion Zila is a two mana, one one. When it enters the battlefield, we draw a card and we lose a life. So just a little bit ways to dig a little bit deeper. That's one of the things that Black Flax is uh, ways to draw cards. But you know it's a you know it's a decent card that does that. We got Lazatop Reaver. It's a two mana one two creates a uh, mass is one which essentially creates a zombie and essentially put a plus one plus one counter on an army creature we control. Um, if we don't have one, we create one. So essentially, it's a two for one for two mana. Um, we have Priest of the Forgotten Gods, which is a pretty integral part of the combo uh, that we're trying to set up because we can sacrifice two other creatures. Uh, any number of target players each lose two life and sacrifice a creature and then we add two mana and then we draw a card so it's definitely a good way to kind of get rid of your opponent's things that may be in the way by sacrificing our things which definitely helps out with you know maybe getting another citrus flyer uh trigger uh maybe you know just getting something into the graveyard that would make its trigger go off again uh definitely get there uh let's that reaver definitely is a good two for one to set up for a priest of forgotten gods um and you know just having our opponent lose a life sacrificing a creature a strong uh, us gaining two uh, mana and then also being able to draw a card is definitely very, very good to, for us to utilize to kind of get over the top on our opponent. Black Bloom Rogue, again, it's an okay card. If your opponent plays a lot of things in their graveyard, it can get bigger and become more of a pain because then it becomes a 5-3 with Menace, so they have to commit two things to block it. Worst case scenario, we can always just play it as a land, but overall pretty decent card. 
like I said, Crow of the Dark Titans, just like, you know, Stitcher Supplier has flying. It costs a little bit more, but with the idea of it, you know, milling us, you know, two cards when it comes in and out of the play is definitely very good. Gate to the Afterlife is another card that's actually very good here. Whenever we ca whenever a non-token creature we control dies, we may gain a life, then we may draw a card if you do discard a card. So it's definitely a good way for us to, like, draw and discard to kind of throw things in the graveyard to maybe get back up with the, with the God Pharaoh's Gift. The other ability of it is we can tap two, sacrifice it, um, search our library for uh, graveyard hand and or library for card named God Pharaoh's Gift, put on the battlefield. Uh, if you search your library this way, uh, shuffle it, and we can only activate it if there are six or more cards in our graveyard. So a good thing is we're trying to put as at least six creatures in our graveyard at any given time to eventually get this out on the battlefield for a little bit cheaper. Uh, then we get the Ravenous Chupacabra. It's uh, you know four mana, two, two. When it enters the battlefield, destroy target creature and opponent controls. Uh, definitely a very good card in the sense that it's, just, it's a creature. Also, it can kill a creature that may be on your opponent's side of the battlefield. I already went over Low Leth Giant. It's a seven mana, six, five. But the undergrowth ability with it dealing one damage uh, target opponent for each creature card in a graveyard is definitely very, very good. Um, you know, it's it's on the cheaper end. And then we have God Pharaoh's Gift, like I said. Beginning of our combat, each turn we may exile a creature card from our graveyard. If we do create a token that's a copy of that card, except it's a 4 4 black zombie, it gains haste and turn. So if we get any of the cards that have like this enter the battlefield effect, uh, we can re trigger it and therefore, you know, um, get a 4 4 zombie that can attack immediately, which is definitely very good. And then to go over the mana base real quick, it is two Phyrexian Towers, which is another good way for us to sacrifice creatures to get two black mana. We can also tap it for colorless. The one thing, it is a legendary land, so you can only have one of them um so you can't have multiple uh which is the one downside but it's it's why we only play two so we don't draw into it as often because you, you don't want to draw an awkward hand we have multiples of them and you can only really play one um and then you have 18 swamps which to fin finish it off overall the deck is pretty straightforward we're not really trying to play these more expensive cards we're trying to you know get things like gate of the afterlife out to then eventually get there um, but overall, the deck is pretty fun. It is pretty simple. It is kind of a cool little combo deck. That's one of the things you may notice in Historic is that there's a lot more combo decks out there. Um, so it's one of those things that um, doesn't cost a lot to build. I think, like I said, comes in at eight rares in total, you know, four here and four there. Um, so, you know, a little bit more expensive than my typical budget videos, but definitely a good starter point if this is something you're looking to get into. So this next deck up is, I think, the most expensive out of all the decks that I currently are going over in this video. But I do think it's kind of like a cheap deck as well um, in the sense of, you know, it's still not super expensive that you would see in a lot of the meta decks, you know, being full of rares and mythics for the most part. But I think this one comes in at a total of, um, what is this, 4, 8, uh, 12, um, plus 2 mythics there. Um, so you're looking at... Uh, 14 total rare slash mythics to being here for ox of Aganis. the one benefit is if you've been playing any strict saving or since call time maybe you already have some of these cards because some of these cards are standard legal you have ox of Aganis, which is standard legal bergy which is also from call time which is also standard legal um and grape shot is also from strict saving packs if you opened any of these maybe you have already a couple copies but essentially this deck is a combo deck what we're trying to do here is set up for us to have a lot of mana um, and also so that we can uh, play a very large Grape Shot. Uh, grape Shot has this ability called Storm. Whenever we cast a spell, we copy it for each spell that was cast before this turn. We choose new copies for that spell. So essentially what we're trying to do here is we have a couple cards that are going to hopefully help us get us there. As you can kind of see here, we have a little bit of these very cantrip kind of style of spells that don't really cost a lot, allow us to kind of dig a little bit deeper into our deck and then hopefully, you know, you know get our spell count up pretty high so we get definitely a pretty decent grape shot um the other way that we're trying to do this we're trying to make this weird infinite mana loop in a way that is allowing us to uh you know cast our spells uh get mana in the process also maybe to dig a little bit deeper to then draw some of our other spells to then you know keep the combo kind of going to eventually then draw into a grape shot or if we already have one play the grape shot um the way we do this is we do we do it in one of two ways we have Bergy God of Storytelling um, for its ability that whenever we cast a spell, we may add red mana until end of turn. You don't lose this mana as steps pass, pass, uh, steps pass or phases end and creatures you control can boost twice. But the second, the second part of the ability is not really important. It's really that part of whenever we cast a spell, we add red mana until end of turn. The next card we're trying to do this with is we're playing the Green and Ignis. Uh, it's a three mana two two we may pay one red we turn to our hand and we add two colorless and a red and we can only activate it as a sorcery so we can do it immediately because it's not a tap ability it's just pay mana and then we can do the effect so what we're trying to do here is you're kind of kind of putting these two together so every time we play it we're going to gain a mana and then we're going to you know bounce it back uh with said mana and then you know get the mana to then be able to replay it again which is definitely very good 
Uh, but that's not really creating that infinite mana loop, which is going to allow us to play other things on top of it. Uh, what we also have here is a card called Hazard's Monument, a three mana artifact. Red creature spells we, we ca cast cost one less to cast, so they all become one less, which makes it very good for us to allow us, you know, be able to play them a lot more efficiently. You know, maybe be able to play this on turn three, play this on turn four, followed by this, uh, and then being able to start the combo right then and there. But remember, we cast a creature spell, we may discard a card. If we do, we may draw a card. So this is allowing us to get rid of things in our hand that maybe not that may not be useful for our combo. Maybe so we can dig a little bit deeper, find cards that we kind of need uh, to kind of you know hopefully get to that combo point. So definitely very interesting there. We also have Ox of Aganis here. Uh, as we're discarding a lot of things into our graveyard, we're gonna be able to escape it for the two red mana. Uh, it comes back on the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it. Uh, and then when it, when it enters the battlefield, we discard our hand and we draw three new cards, which is definitely very good if we're not really drawn into anything that's super useful. Um, the other card here is Runaway Steamkin. It's an interesting card that we can definitely play on our turn two, but whenever we cast a red spell, it actually has fewer than three counters on it. We get to put a plus one plus one counter on it, so it becomes a threat. Uh, every time we play a red spell, it becomes bigger and bigger. The other benefit here is remove three plus one plus one counters from it, we add three red mana. So what we're trying to do here, which is yet again, very interesting, if we can get, get it to pull it off, it is kind of a little bit of a complicated combo to really get all the pieces together. But if you get some of the pieces together, you can still probably get it to work. But if you get uh, Bergy out, you get Grim Ignis out, and you get Runaway Steamkin out, essentially what we are able to do now is every time we, you know, do this effect back and forth, back and forth, you know, you know, bouncing himself, replaying himself from the one red mana that we're getting from here, uh, Runaway Steamkin is also getting counters on it every time we're doing it. We're going to get him up to four counters. After that time, we then, you know, we, we, you know, redeem those four, remove the three counters, we get the three red mana, keep on doing the process over and over again. This will allow us to play other things from our hand. So things like Warlord's Fury, Steam, Spikefield Hazard, Faithless Looting, Crash Through, uh, you know, some of our cantrips and allows us to kind of keep that going on and on and on. Uh, the other benefit here is as well is as we're doing all this stuff, the storm counter is going up. Um, so essentially, you know, you want to get to at least 20 if, you know, your opponent's not full life. Um, so that's kind of like the whole concept is we're just trying to, you know, get these couple cards out to kind of keep that infinite loop going of us gaining mana and then, you know, every time we play red spell, so on and so forth. I know it sounds kind of confusing. Storm is kind of a weird, intriguing effect in a way. Um, the one thing that's actually kind of cool about Storm is that your opponent has to have a card that removes all of the spells from the stack, not just the first one. Um, so it kind of is interesting because we cast a spell and then we copy it for each spell that was casted before this turn. So essentially, if we, let's just say your opponent's at 20, to be on the safe side, maybe they have a counter spell up, you do, I don't know, you do, uh, you know, 25. Uh, you know, they may counter the, the initial grape shot, but you're gonna still get 24 copies of that, you know, grape shot that are still gonna go off and hit your opponent in the face. You know, it's just one of those things that is actually very intriguing about Storm. The only way they can do this is they have to have a card that literally says, you know, counter target spell plus all other spells that are maybe on the stack in the process in order to do so. But overall, it's a pretty interesting combo. Yet again, I kind of want to give you a little bit of combos. Um, <sighs> Overall, outside of that, I don't really know how this deck does if it has to become more of an aggro deck, but it's still kind of a cool thing that kind of like, you know, some card interaction to kind of, you know, create this infinite mana loop and then eventually have a large grape shot. All right, so the next deck up is kind of an interesting deck. Yet again, it's a tribal deck. Uh, you may see some other tribal decks pop up in Arena, but I figure this is actually probably the cheaper of all of them uh, to come and craft. Um, you know, some of this is stuff that you really probably won't have for the most part if you just recently started to get into MTG Arena. Uh, a lot of the cards in this Merfolk uh, Historic deck are actually from the older sets. So if you've been playing since back in the day, maybe you already have them. But if you're someone who's newer, you may have to go ahead and craft a lot of these cards. Um, but the whole idea here is we're playing Merfolk Tribal. It's a cool cool kind of tribal deck. It's kind of like a Neo and Elves. It's kind of like a Goblins. Um, but Merfolk are kind of cool because a lot of them are a little bit more in that controly slash tempo -y kind of style. Uh, you know cards types um and overall you know the deck what we're trying to do here is just kind of overwhelm our opponent with merfolk and they kind of do various things so i, I feel like going through each card kind of talking about how it kind of interacts with the whole deck as a whole is definitely kind of cool so the first card up is merfolk Windwabber. uh you would never guess you know from playing uh rogues in standard that this is actually a merfolk but it's definitely kind of a cool card a one mana one one whenever it deals common to a damage to a player mill a card if our opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard we can always sacrifice it you kind of know the effects if you do play a lot of standard then we have to miss cloak herald it's a one mana one one that it can't be blocked so definitely a good little you know get some you know easy damage in for one damage early on until we start building up our board uh we have 
Kumina's speaker. It's a one mana one one. It has plus one plus one as long as you control another Merfolk or an island. So definitely very good. It's kind of one of those synergies that Merfolk kind of have, you know, with the lanes you're playing, as well as you know there being other Merfolk on the battlefield. Then we have the Silver Girl Adept. It's a two mana two one. Additional cost to cast a spell. We may reveal Merfolk from our hand, or we have to pay three additional. But when it enters the battlefield, we just draw a card. So you know, some a little bit of a tempo play as, overall. You know, you play your your Kumina's uh, speaker on turn one, you play your Adept on turn two, reveal maybe your turn three Merfolk or just another Merfolk in general. Uh, definitely, you know, and then you draw a card. So definitely like a, a two for one kind of thing, you know, you get something and you get a card back into your hand. So you kind of fill back that slot you just played something from. So definitely very good there. Uh, we got Merfolk Trickster, which is definitely another good rogue here. It's a flash rogue. So we play it on our opponent's turn as if it was an instant spell. Um, and when it enters the battlefield, we get to tap target creature and opponent controls. And that creature loses all abilities until end of turn. So essentially, if your opponent's trying to do something, you know, in, you know, interacting with a creature that's on their side of the battlefield, we play this, we tap that creature down, and then if it has like an ability that, you know, let's just say it's, I don't know, Priest of the Forgotten Gods. Essentially, you make Priest of the Forgotten Gods lose that ability. Or maybe it's a creature that has flying, you then make that creature lose flying, so now your opponent can't actually fly over for that extra damage. So essentially, that's kind of what Merfolk Trickster is trying to do, is trying to tap down your opponent's creature, as well as also make that creature lose its ability. Then of course, get Merfolk Mistbinder. It's essentially uh, one of our uh, Merfolk Lords. Uh, it gives all our other Merfolk plus one plus one. It's a two mana two two, which is definitely very good. Uh, you got Glass Plume Mimic here. It's not really a Merfolk in itself, but it can become a copy of target creature uh, you control, except it's a shapeshifter rogue in addition to its other types. So essentially you can copy any of your other rogues. Maybe you definitely want another Merfolk Mistbinder to pump up all your rogues. You can copy it and then you have extra copies. It also is a land, though I would say, you know, you could always maybe think of other cards to play outside of this if you don't have any of these. But if you are playing a lot of standard, you may already have some of these playing since Zendikar Horizon because it's the set it comes from. Worst case scenario, you always play it as a land and, you know, just you know, have a land on the battlefield in case you need that additional blue. You have the Mir Miro Rejury. It's a three mana two two Merfolk that gives all our other Merfolk creatures we control plus one plus one. And then when we cast a Merfolk spell, we may tap or untap the target permanent. So essentially, this is kind of like our way. You know, it's a, like a little bit of a like Merfolk lockdown. So during your turn, you can you know play a Merfolk like after this is played, tap them maybe one of your opponent's creatures that could be used as a blocker, uh, and therefore kind of allowing yourself to get in through that extra damage. Uh, the other cool thing is during your other during your opponent's turn, if you have something like your Merfolk Trickster in your hand, you, you have this out in the battlefield, you play the Merfolk Trickster. Not only do you get to tap target permanent based on the Merfolk Trickster's trigger, you also get to tap an additional creature with this trigger. So definitely kind of cool second triggers to kind of lock down your opponent's creatures. And it's actually, the other thing too, um, this says tap or untap target permanent. So you can actually even t uh, tap lands if you think your opponent may have a spell that they may be trying to cast. Um, you know, with their mana that they have open. Uh, then you have Jungleborn Pioneer. It's a three mana two two. When it enters the battlefield, we create a one one blue Merfolk creature token with hexproof. So it's definitely kind of cool. You know, it's a, a token that your opponent can't directly target with a spell. The only way they can do, uh, the only way they can target it is with a global effect uh, that would make a sacrifice a creature or something like that. But other than that, I mean, getting a two for one for three mana is definitely very good. And having the, the second part of the two for one have hexproof is definitely even better. And then, of course, I do think a lot of the tribal decks you may notice play this card called Collective Company once you start playing a lot more historic. Essentially, what this is, uh, it's a pretty good card. It's a four mana instant speed. Uh, you probably want to do this at the end of your opponent's turn unless your opponent is attacking aggressively and they may be tapped out regardless. But typically, you do this at the end of your opponent's turn. Uh, you look at the top six cards of your library. You put two creature cards with a converted man cost, three or less among them onto the battlefield. And then you put the rest of the, on the bottom of your library in any order. So essentially, what you're trying to do here is just trying to, you know, for four mana, you're going to get hopefully... One of these cards here as you can kind of see we don't really play any spells uh most of the cards that you would hit from this would just be uh merfolk so you're hopefully gonna at least hit a good decent to pick from and kind of figure out based on the situation what you kind of need do you need more merfolk mist binders do you need more uh mirror regeries do you need some merfolk tricksters or do you just need you know just like you know a couple jungle board pioneers to just get some more merfolk on the battlefield that will get pumped up by your maybe your lord that's already on the battlefield you know it's one of those things depending on the situation you kind of pick out what merfolk you kind of need based on what you reveal i mean i hopefully you don't reveal and don't get a single merfolk i do think with us playing a good chunk of them you know here uh you know there are 35 creatures in the deck you have a good chance off of one collective company to hit a merfolk in that process Outside of the that, the mana base is pretty straightforward. You know, you got nine islands, six forests. Uh, you have four, uh, two copies of Thorwind Falls, which is, you know, okay. Uh, the one thing I would recommend if you are playing Historic, looking to, you know, have an untapped mana, 
Um, just because untapped mana is always better because when you play tap mana, you got to take a turn off from maybe playing that more expensive spell. Unless you're on turn one, don't have a turn one play. Typically, you know, you want to be on turn whenever you play your first, you know, whenever you play your land so you can play your bigger spell if you have that. Um, but, you know, it's a decent land to start off and until you eventually work your way to get in those mana uh, lands. Uh, this is definitely a good way to play. And then you have also unclean territory, which is also a very good um land for this style of deck so essentially as it enters the battlefield we get to choose a creature type we're playing merfolk so we just choose merfolk uh it tap for adding colorless or you can tap and add one man of any color and spend that mana only cast a creature spell of that chosen type so definitely very good there uh it can help us filter our mana maybe get a little awkward hand maybe have more green no blue um you know you could say merfolk now you can add, cast all your merfolk that have blue in it though you would need double blue for that but outside of that you know it's definitely very good there downfall is it can't play collect the company because it doesn't tap for uh mana that would produce the color to play collect the company but it does tap for colorless so you can still play collect the company with the other mana but overall pretty cool little tribal deck that's inexpensive uh this one doesn't play it only plays four rares which is definitely very our seven rares if you include the mimic um but it's you know it's definitely a good deck to kind of get you started as well if you're looking to play some tribal though uh, you know it's one of those things that i think you need to build upon in order to make it better there are definitely some better merfolk but they do cost you know some extra mythics and rares overall now this last deck here is definitely an interesting deck overall i mean it is mono red um though i would say what we're trying to do here is a little bit different than your typical mono red that you're used to in standard uh it is like uh burn mono red which is definitely very good it's definitely very potent there's a lot more decks that are you know targeting you know removal type of things this is a little bit more expensive of a deck um you know it does have eight rares in it um some of them though if you are playing standard you may already have four of them being bone crusher giants the other rare that you need to craft if you don't have it is soul scar mage it's from uh amon ket it's an interesting card here but i'll kind of go through all the cards and kind of talk about them so the first card we have is Gitu Lava Run. It's a one mana, one two, and as long as there are two or more instances of sorcery cards in our graveyard, it gets plus one plus zero and has haste. So initially, you know, turn one, it's not going to have haste, but as you play your your burn spells throughout the game, it's going to eventually get that additional plus one plus zero, and then he copies that after it has the two uh, instances of sorcery cards in our graveyard. Um, it's the future copies that would come on the battlefield after this effect goes in effect will have that plus one plus zero and haste. So it's a one mana, two two eventually, uh, but definitely a very good solid turn one play. It wouldn't be um it wouldn't be a mono red deck without like some form of shock uh so we have a one mana shock in the deck just good for that one uh two damage to any target player or creature that may be in your way you got soul scar mage which is another interesting card here um it's a one mana uh one two with prowess uh prowess is an ability if you haven't played the is it like you know is it uh spells deck that from standard um whenever you cast a non-creature spell it gets plus one plus one to end a turn um so it can get uh bigger and bigger depending on how many spells you are able to cast in a single turn and if a source we can shield do non combat damage to a uh, creature an opponent controls it you get to put that many minus one minus one counters on the creature instead so this is actually very interesting here you may be thinking to yourself okay that's that seems okay but you know i'd rather just kill the creature well let's just say you you may not be able to have you don't have enough burn in your deck to maybe take down their very very big like elder gargroth you know it's a six six but let's just say you have like a couple shocks or something in your hand so you cast a shock it deals two damage to that elder gargroth so instead of that damage going away at the end of like your turn uh the shock puts now minus one minus one counters on the elder gargroth so it goes from a six six into a four four it's, it just we it puts your opponent's creature down a peg when it comes to power so it's definitely a good way if you don't have enough uh burn to kind of remove something that's bigger um and you know giving something minus one minus one is definitely a good way to get around that then we have lightning strike it's a uh, two mana instant speed spell it deals three damage to any target uh four copies i don't i guess i don't own four copies from uh this set i own you know three copies here and one copy there um but you know you can figure out whichever set you want and whatever art you like you can always go ahead and craft it and you just deal three damage to any target for two mana which is definitely also very good um you know as you can kind of see some of the burn is a little bit more more a little bit uh is a little bit more powerful um you know for the mana that you're paying and it's also instant speed which is also very good I mean, the Vashino Pyromancer, so two mana, two one. When it enters the battlefield, it deals two damage to target player or planeswalker. So it's just a creature that comes in the battlefield without even attacking is already dealing two damage to your opponent's face, uh, which is which is definitely very good and very. If we're trying to be very aggressive with these smaller creatures, it's definitely a good way to get into that. Then the next card up, we have Burn Tree Emissary. This is actually a very interesting card here. At one point, this was actually banned in historic because of its power. Um, and you and you may be thinking to yourself, okay, it's pretty decent. It's a two mana two two. But the the idea here is not only is it a two mana two two, um, it's a two mana two two that actually produces mana that replaces the mana that you spent to cast it. So you may play one of these. 
you know, and then you get two mana open, a red and a green. And that red and the green can essentially play any of your cards that are two mana that are, you know, here um, for the most part. Uh, you know, for the most part, you can play this and then play another two mana two two or two one. So, or you play another one of these, get more mana than possibly something else, or play into a burn spell. Definitely very good and very versatile. Um, you know, having a very strong turn two with a burning tree emissary can definitely set you up for a very quick win. Um, so overall, very good card. I mean, it's maybe not as potent as if it was something like uh, Gruel Aggro, which is definitely another deck that's actually pops up from time to time. That's definitely very good. Um, but you know, it's it, it fits its place. It, you know, it produces mana that replaces the mana you spent to cast. It makes it overall pretty strong card for just being an uncommon. Of course, you got Bone Crusher Giant. Uh, if you play standard, this is something you may already have copies of. I know you do definitely get one from, I think it's the Mono Red Star deck, or if not, it's the Stompy Stompy starter deck. Uh, so you may have already have one copy, but it's a it's a very strong card. It's one of those things that I think a lot of people are just not going to miss in standard uh, when it's out. You know, when one has a two mana open, you know, they may not, you know, now you're not thinking to yourself, oh man, I'm going to get stomped to the base, especially if they're playing some sort of deck that plays red. Um, so, you know, the stomp ability that deals two damage to any target is very good. The three mana creature that actually has kind of a little bit of protection that makes your opponent think if I want to actually target with a spell, get two damage. So it kind of helps our burn, uh, you know, ability overall. Definitely a very strong card, especially in the style of deck, as we're just trying to do a lot of damage to our opponent's face as quickly as possible or as cheap as possible. Another interesting card here is, that's very good that made Bono Red actually even more of a pain to play is uh, Blade at the Stage. This is a very strong card in the sense that, you know, for three mana, you actually get to exile the top two cards of your library. To end your next turn, you may play those cards. And then there's uh, this ability called Spectacle. You may cast this spell for its Spectacle cost rather than play its mana cost if an opponent lo lost life this turn. So you can do this one of two ways. You may attack in, get your damage in, then play the Spectacle cost on your following, on your like your second main phase, or you ping your opponent for you know a shock damage, get your Spectacle of your latent stage, late the stage go up, dig a little bit deeper, maybe you find that burn spell you're looking to play, finish off your opponent that way. Definitely a very very good card. Uh, for it possibly being only one mana to do this ability. Then you got Wizard's Lightning. Um, definitely a great card. It's a three mana, th uh, three damage to any target. It costs two less if we control a wizard. Our Soul Scar Mage is a wizard. Our Get to Lava Runner is a wizard. Our Pyromancer is also a wizard. This is a Shaman. But overall, we have a lot of wizards in the deck that can definitely make this card cost one mana. And one mana instant burn for three damage is definitely very, very good. Worst case scenario, you are paying the three mana. But overall, very strong card. And we got Annex here, which is kind of like probably the awkward one. It doesn't really fit into that idea of burn. But it's definitely a very good card that kind of just, you know, fills the role. We do have a decent amount of devotion that we can, you know, get on the board in a way. Because a lot of our stuff is has red mana in it or has double red in it. And essentially, you know, it's gets its power equal to devotion to red, and whenever one of our other creatures dies, uh, we get a 1 1 satyr creature token with this creature can't block. If the creature had four or greater, we create two satyrs. So, definitely just a good way to get some board presence overall, but just a big card that definitely can help finish off the game if you're looking for something that's a little bit more aggressive than maybe a bone crusher. And then the mana base is pretty straightforward. The deck is not super expensive on what we're trying to play card wise. So, it has 16 mountains and has four of these ram up nap ruins which essentially it's tap it for colorless tap it pay one life add red mana or for four mana we can sacrifice it and deal two damage to each opponent so definitely another card that just has built in burn which just makes it that much better so overall i mean this is historic burn yet again you know you're gonna see a lot more mono red poly pop up though i would say this is one version of it this may not be the best version just because i we, we are missing a few cards but mono red burn is actually a very strong deck in historic overall Especially when you get those more, when you get the few of the extra cards that make this deck that much better. Um, though you also have the mono red goblins out there. Um, so it's one of those things, depending on what you're thinking, you know, you can kind of figure out how you want to go about, you know, building, you know, your budget decks when it comes to standard. So with that being said, I mean, that is kind of like a little bit of an intro to kind of get you started if that's something you're looking get into for uh historic each of the decks coming up with a various amount of budgets but each a unique way of how they want to play this historic meta i think each is a good way to get into i do have a video on the channel that i did go over maybe about six months ago i think uh about historic budget decks as well that's still pretty useful because the meta in the most part hasn't switched up too much i think the only thing we've had since then that really got added to the meta as a whole is just the anthology that just recently came out uh, about a month ago or so so i mean other than that those decks are also still very useful um i think that one has like the auras deck that's kind of out there right now and there's maybe some other decks that i can't remember that i did in the video that you can definitely check out there but guys if you like the video hit that like button it definitely but 
lets me you guys like these videos. If you're new here, want to know when I post new videos on the channel, hit that subscribe button. And until next time, I'll see you later. I just want to give a special shout out to the channel members. It definitely lets me know you guys like to support the channel. You can also become a channel member simply by clicking the join button down and down by the subscribe button and or clicking the link in the description. It definitely helps out the channel. With that being said, guys, I'll see you later.